Good afternoon or, or good evening, everyone. And uh, so I, my name uh, is uh, Roberto Dandi. I am a, a faculty here at the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross. Uh, um, I welcome uh, all of you, uh, dear speakers and uh, participants, uh, physically here on, or online, uh, to this uh, speaker series. Uh, about uh, the management of the church because uh, here at uh, the University of the Holy Cross uh, we are we run a program of church management and um, in, uh, in addition to it uh, we, we organize the, this series of, uh, of uh, seminars uh, to uh, make uh, some uh, discussion and uh, reflection about uh, um, best practices and uh, case studies in the in the management of uh, the church, church organizations around the world and uh, this uh, seminar as you know is focused on uh, healthcare management and healthcare organizations and uh, i am very pleased to uh, introduce you um, uh, this uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, who will uh, bring uh, uh, the point of view of uh, the church in, uh, in different settings. Because uh, we know that uh, healthcare uh, as a sector is, is an important, uh, uh, is an important uh, tool, is an important uh, mean for uh, the church to reach, uh, uh, of course, uh, those in need of care and but also for interfaith uh, uh, relationship especially in countries like india and pakistan where the majority of uh, of the population is non-catholic so um, here we focus on the management challenges of uh, uh, healthcare institution around the world and uh, so we will have uh, first uh, um, Father Abraham, who is the, the general director of the Catholic uh, Health Association of India, the largest association, healthcare association in the world, uh, comprising more than uh, 3,500 uh, hospitals as members. And then we will have uh, uh, Father McCulloch, who is uh, in Pakistan now, and he, he lived in Pakistan many years, and and uh, run uh, healthcare institutions there uh, very successfully. And uh, uh, last but not least, uh, we have uh, the president of uh, Campus Biomedico, a university, university hospital here in Rome uh, that was found, founded uh, um, in the 90s, early 90s, uh, uh, after the suggestion of uh, uh, Father Escrivà, Saint Escrivà, and uh, um, Mr. Felice Barella was one of those who worked to make the hospital a reality, a successful reality as it is now. So thank you all. And uh, I, I don't want to take uh, more time uh, uh, from, uh, for, from your speeches. And uh, I thank you all. And I ask uh, uh, Father Matthew to, to start with his presentation. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, first of all, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I will share the screen, uh, uh, the presentation. Uh, can you see the presentation? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, is it clear now? Yes, yes. Full size. Okay, uh, this is the content of, of my uh, bring this. Uh, so this is my uh, brief uh, background. I'm a medical doctor specialized in community health. Uh, while doing my medical studies, I got experience and developed kind of a personal relationship with uh, God. And uh, that slowly led me uh, to a, a sense of mission becoming uh, a religious, a priest. Right now, I am currently working with the 
Catholic Health Association of India as the Director General. Uh, well, uh, in the midst of these challenges, we have learned uh, uh, how to be happy. So uh, that's about me. Uh, well, this is the global overview of healthcare. Briefly, you can see the statistics there. Um, uh, some numbers, 26% of the healthcare facilities in the world is uh, uh, network. Um, then you can also see that was the 2010 uh, statistics, the previous one. You can see some more numbers here. This is shared uh, uh, with others, so uh, I'm not going into the details of this. Uh, you can see those numbers. Well, if you look at the global scenario, uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is an insight which I, I gained uh, after my discussions with some of the uh, our counterparts in different parts of the world. Once in a year, we meet uh, uh, for discussions. Uh, so if you look at the European scenario, uh, religious uh, life and our institutions uh, come down, the hospitals have come down, and uh, uh, some of these hospitals have been taken by uh, government or private agencies where even the uh, the core values. Uh, when it comes to US and Australia, we can see uh, a, a little different scenario. Uh, religious life, uh, <coughs> but before uh, religious life uh, the, uh, disappeared completely, uh, the sister somehow managed to get uh, in. Uh, so there are entities like Ascension Health in US, where the lay people are uh, taking forward the charism of different congregations. Very and uh, uh, find entities like St. Vincent's, Mercy Health, Cabrini Health, again, uh, lay people helping. But when it comes to India and Africa, we uh, and there is a possibility of probably sustaining both religious life as well as hospitals um, um, in, uh, if we are able to happen in Europe and in US and Australia. Well, this is an overview about uh, uh, the Chai uh, network, um, Catholic India. So far, members are located in remote, medically underserved areas. You can see some of these numbers. Uh, we are a network of 3,573 uh, institutions. Most of it are uh, small health centers in remote areas. We have about 50,000 uh, nuns uh, who are qualified in healthcare. About 1,000 of them are doctors, and uh, the rest are nurses or administrators or paramedicals or even social workers who are involved in uh, community health. We annually we care for about 21 million uh, patients. Uh, these numbers uh, uh, may not be very accurate because we have a problem of uh, uh, getting uh, data. Data is sitting in. Uh, uh, in different institutions. So we have a difficulty in getting accurate data, but these are uh, some approximate numbers. Well, if you look into the next slide, we pick up uh, about 650 of them are hospitals, uh, ranging from 10 beds to 1,000 beds. Uh, most of them uh, ranging between 10 to 50 beds, or even uh, 100 to 200 beds. Then we have about 2,350 health centers. Uh, we have about 35. Uh, <clears throat> there are two dimensions uh, for CHAI, Catholic Association of India. It is an NGO and, as, uh, and it is a network. As a non-governmental organization, uh, we focus on uh, four major areas. Disability care, palliative care, children with HIV, and community health. Actually, uh, a cross cutting uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, focus. Uh, we work in villages uh, trying to develop village or making the people healthy, uh, but also our disability, palliative care, and uh, other programs also have a community health uh, component, a home based uh, care component. As an NGO, we try to we strive for excellence in project implementation. 
and also try to handle our data, manage our data for transparency and efficiency. And uh, that once we, uh, uh, we get funding. Uh, as a network, um, we strengthen our member institutions. We try to strengthen our member institutions. We help them to develop leadership and the healthcare skills. Um, interdependence is something which we are trying to uh, work on. How do we, uh, and of course, there is, we work on uh, advocacy in some areas. <clears throat> These are some of the challenges faced by our healthcare institutions. If we are classified it into external and we have uh, uh, some laws and regulations that affect uh, 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 our work. <clears throat> Corruption is another factor. Uh, government facilities are improved. It's, it's a good thing. So uh, those places we are not, uh, uh, not relevant now. We also face which uh, gave us a lot of difficulty. Commercialization of healthcare is something which has affected us a lot. Uh, we have a shortage of staff, uh, and uh, sometimes in some places reduced vocations also to manage our institutions. Internally, one of the uh, major skill gap, uh, major problem is skills and knowledge. Uh, especially in areas of leadership, management, clinical, uh, and community health. Now, these are the areas. And many of our sisters also go through burnout. Uh, uh, several reasons, including uh, skill gap and a lot of workload. Some of the management issues in uh, our, our institutions, in many of the managers or administrators are uh, sister nurses who had been uh, either uh, uh, made uh, who was, was asked to take up uh, administrative uh, many of some of them are trained some of them are not trained so are they uh, as managers they also go through this dilemma of uh, being doers and finding <clears throat> we also have this problem of uh, running around all the day you know, you know not properly managing uh, issues now between uh, uh, the, with the limited time. Um, also, this issue of management raises uh, compassion, especially when it comes to uh, Sometimes there are conflicts, so uh, we, uh, we find it difficult to choose the right uh, people for the right position. Um, issues related to uh, uh, decision making. Uh, uh, there are also issues of sustainability, financial sustainability, subsidization in order to uh, support poor people. Uh, we, it's also important for us to network with other. Um, there's also a challenge of uh, updating knowledge, constant learning. These kind of problems are there because of lack of time. Uh, some of the challenges of working in a non-Catholic uh, situation. Uh, in India, Catholics are only about 1.5% of the Indian uh, society. So many do not follow Catholic uh, bioethics. For example, uh, issues like uh, family planning. Uh, most of our people are so they don't understand uh, uh, these uh, uh, values or principles. <clears throat> Some of the government regulations are not in line. Uh, example, for several years, we have this Medical Termination of Pregnancy Act, which promotes abortion, uh, and family planning is very much promoted by the government here. We also uh, have growing religious fundamentalism. Uh, in the past, uh, India was known as a, a very tolerant country, but today there's a growing which is affecting us in a way. <clears throat> Some of the potential solutions we are working on. Um, we have, last year we developed a vision 2030. Uh, is mostly, there are challenges which we are not able to handle, which are beyond our control, but we are trying to handle the challenges which we can. Um, and we deal with the problem of uh, perishing in isolation or working in isolation. 
<clears throat> that's where we are uh, working on something called a chai academy uh, to help sisters to develop their leadership skills the management skills uh, clinical skills community health skills and also uh, even uh, spirituality so these are uh, chai academy is shaping up it is not at uh, uh, full swing we also have an initiative called the common procurement portal the procurement happens in the network but uh, because each one is procuring independently a lot of money is being uh, lost to the middlemen uh, so we are trying to do a common portal uh, it, it is like uh, uh, amazon uh, uh, kind of a thing uh, where uh, we negotiate and uh, prices uh, healthcare products so that uh, sisters could buy it it helps our institutions to save some money also to build systems uh, uh, so, uh, data uh, in order to make decisions based on that uh, another initiative is uh, we are also uh, trying to create an online community for the sisters by through professional support as well as uh, to support them in spirituality just to uh, before concluding i would like to briefly uh, uh, our vision is to promote compassionate affordable quality care at the margins of the society uh, and these are the core values which uh, we compassionate care affordable care quality care and especially at the margins of the society this is a brief overview of our vision uh, document uh, i'm not going into the details of this uh, because of lack of time but our uh, vision document is available on our website uh, this is what we're looking forward to uh, what should the sister? This is predominantly a sisters' organization. Uh, Eighty percent of the institutions are managed by sisters. Um, so, how should the sister? What should a sister be in 2030? She should be a leader in sustainable human development and quality care. Uh, she should have a rich inner life and a witnessing lifestyle. And she should be empowered uh, to manage their institutions values through capacity building through a chai academy and their inspiring stories are not heard so we would like their inspiring stories to be heard to be made uh, that is all about thank you grazie i i hope i uh, grazie is the italian for uh, thanks Grazie, grazie. I can lose it. Grazie. All right. So, uh, thank you very much, uh, Father uh, Matthew. And uh, so, I think we can uh, leave the questions at the very end of the presentations. And so, without uh, further uh, ado, we, we leave the floor to Father uh, Robert McCulloch. McCulloch. Uh, Father McCulloch, yes. Yes, I'm here. Yes, sure. You can uh, you can start. Thank you. Can begin. Yes. Can you hear me very well? Uh, yes. Yes. Thank you. you. We can hear you. All right. Thank. So good evening from Saint Elizabeth Hospital in Hyderabad in Pakistan where I am right at the moment. Um, I was chair of the administrative council of this hospital for about 10 years up until November 2011, when I was appointed to Rome, and I've remained as the donor representative for the hospital up to the present time. And most recently I've been appointed chair of the hospital board in the reorganization of the governance and administration and management of the hospital. Uh, the topic that I've been asked to discuss with you is hot management issues in Catholic healthcare. 
but some of the issues that I want to speak to you about are not simply hot, but they're sizzling. Um, like how to deal with the commands of government officers for appreciation so that the hospital can remain open or so that its key services can remain active. And this is a milder way of talking about the hard reality of corrupt practices which threaten what we want to do as a Catholic healthcare organization. Father Abram has just referred to that in the Indian context. We have the same situation here in Pakistan. I want to put my presentation in the context of St. Elizabeth Hospital, one hospital in Pakistan. Unfortunately, we don't have a uh, Pakistan Catholic Health Association as in India, in spite of efforts that we've tried to do in the last um, seven or eight years. But what I want to do after I presented this word image of St. Elizabeth Hospital to you, I'd like to take up um, the application of that within the Islamic context of Pakistan. So Hyderabad is in the southeastern part of, of uh, Pakistan, in the province of Sindh, about 175 kilometers from Karachi, on the Indus River, and on the fringe, fringe of the Tara Desert leading into India. So we're close enough to India, but far enough, enough away from India. The population is predominantly Muslim with a big minority of Hindus and a significant minority of Christians. This hospital was begun in 1958 by Dutch lay missionaries. Uh, it's now diocesan owned. It has a Catholic lay administration and management, not sisters, not religious. Its medical staff is Muslim, Hindu and Christian. The nursing and auxiliary staff is all Christian. And that's by our decision to be proactive in overcoming social, cultural, and economic institutionalized discrimination against Christians on the basis of their religion. It's a hundred bed hospital. Its main strength or our strength is in mother and child care. It's got a, a mobile medical outreach program, which annually provides free medical of primary health care to 50,000 uh, Muslim, Christian and Hindu people who are in a serious situation of um, oppression as agricultural laborers. It has Pakistan's first ever home-based palliative care nursing service for terminal ill cancer patients. And it has a government, has a, a, attached a government accredited school of midwifery. So it's a lot of things going on in this one hospital. However, uh, the hospital is continually financially confronted due to the level of free charitable medical care, which it gives to those in greatest need in conformity with the mission of the hospital to, confess, uh, to manifest the compassion of God, just as Pope Francis has urged us in these past few days. And it seeks to become self-supporting through locally generated income, but we also have a network of um, international donors. Statistically, the healthcare proportion of the uh, Pakistan budget is appalling. In 2018, Pakistan spent just 0.67% of GDP on healthcare, and that's according to the latest government statistics in the Pakistani, uh, Pakistan Economic Survey. That same survey says that Pakistan depends on a mix of public health care and private health care. However, the only, how should I say, interreaction of the federal government of Pakistan on St. Elizabeth Hospital is the burden of hugely increased taxation, such as we face, due to the demands of the International Monetary Fund. Before dealing with some of the specific administration and management issues that we at St. Elizabeth face, 
and respond to in the Islamic Republic of Pakistan while fulfilling the mission of Catholic healthcare organizations, I'd like to deal with the overall contextual question as to whether St. Elizabeth Hospital is regarded by the government or in popular um, perception as a foreign organization in Pakistan because it's Catholic and is owned and run by the um, Catholic Diocese of Hyderabad. It's interesting that when St. Elizabeth was opened up in 1958, just after the, the ending of the British Raj in 1947, it was called the American Hospital because it was opened up by women from the Netherlands. All foreigners at that time, or most foreigners, were understood to be British. So any other foreigner had to be American. So this was the name that was popularly put on the hospital. The name stuck due to habit, but has mostly been overcome by recent intensive and extensive attention by the hospital administration to correct uh, brand naming. So now it's popularly called St. Elizabeth Hospital. Although the governance of the hospital is comprised of a mix of Pakistanis and foreigners, uh, the administration and management of the hospital through which St. Elizabeth interfaces with its local community clientele and neighbors in Hyderabad and with the federal and provincial government bodies has been entirely Pakistani since 2011 and all staff and employees are Pakistani. So this has overcome the foreign label and perception even though the hospital is well known uh, in Hyderabad as being Catholic. However, the wider and extremely serious issue that affects St. Elizabeth as a Catholic organization and causes serious management problems is federal government legislation about INGOs and NGOs. This legislation was introduced to control uh, drug running, trafficking, people trafficking, funding of terrorism, and the violence of political, religious, fundamentalist organizations. But it's also been used by the government to disband and expel INGOs and NGOs, which focus on women's and gender issues. Organizations such as, as Save the Children have been negatively affected. In spite of ministers, and permanent secretaries in government uh, departments in Islamabad saying that we know that the Catholic Church is not an INGO or an NGO because we and our wives went to Catholic schools. The legislation is being enforced in a very uh, stifling and repressive way at the lower level on all dioceses, hospitals, schools, religious congregations, uh, bodies such as St. Vincent de Paul, Standard Gideo, and Focolare. Bank accounts have been frozen, and uh, it's very difficult to enter into financial uh, transactions at the present time. We, however, in Hyderabad, at St. Elizabeth Hospital, even though we're having trouble with financial transaction in, uh, transactions in banks have been minimally uh, affected by this legislation. And the reason is the high regard which government authorities in Hyderabad have for the hospital's mobile medical outreach program, which hugely complements the government's healthcare system. Uh, the overall resolution of the effects of these INGOs and uh, uh, of the INGO and NGO legislation on the Catholic Church lies with church authorities. What's needed is a memorandum of understanding between the Holy See and the government of Pakistan concerning the situation of or the status of the Catholic Church in Pakistan. And also uh, an umbrella um, registration under, under government uh, legislation of all Catholic organizations. There's a great will, I must positively say, 
from the point of view of the government of Pakistan and its ministers to achieve this. And uh, the energy needs to come from our Catholic side to bring it about. Um, now, what I'd like to do is from this context, pick up some of the specific administrative and management issues um, at St. Elizabeth's. And the ones which I want to highlight emerge from this above description of the actual situation of the hospital. The first one, uh, issues group that I'd like to look at, are uh, issues arising from the political and religious environment and situation in Pakistan, which has the obvious negative aspects, but which also presents a valuable context and situation for interfaith harmony and interreligious dialogue. The overall situation of Christians in Pakistan is best described as intense discrimination of a minority on the basis of religion, not persecution as such, even though the wider definition of persecution includes discrimination. But we have our, for instance, a hospital open, working, and obviously you can see from the dress that I wear, um, easily and comfortably in Pakistan. St. Elizabeth is openly and freely able to carry out its healthcare ministry in Hyderabad, and importantly, to carry it out according to its Catholic identity, inspiration, and mission statement. Uh, I find in contrast to the situation in India, the key principles of Catholic moral teaching relating to the dignity of life at all stages and covering the provision of health care are explicitly incorporated into the position descriptions for all senior administrative and management officers and into the contracts with all doctors and consultants, whether they're Catholic, other Christians, Muslim or Hindu. The Catholic identity of the hospital is maintained and it's clear, and we have no difficulty in doing this. There's pictures of Pope Francis through the hospital, crucifixes in the administrator's office and management areas. Uh, Muslim patients and their attendants are attentive and caring for Catholics employed at the hospital who keep the Lenten fast in the same way that Catholics are attentive to Muslims, patients and employees while they're maintaining their annual fast. The only problem that St. Elizabeth has with putting up a crib at Christmas in the main entrance area of the hospital is trying to find the statue of the baby Jesus, which continues to go missing. Because it's continually taken off to rooms and wards in the maternity department, mainly by Muslim families and women, as a means of asking for help or help from heaven during difficult delivery cases. What I'm saying here is that we are able to interpenetrate and interreact comfortably as a Catholic hospital in the Muslim environment of the Islamic Republic of Pakistan. Maintaining security is an issue, not so stringent at the present time, but the administration is careful and wise in maintaining good collaboration with the military and the police. And this professional collaboration of Christian and Hindu professionals at St. Elizabeth uh, engenders the context and promotes interfaith harmony and interreligious dialogue. The problems that arise amongst our professionals at the hospital are professional issues and they're not from religion. The major problems with the doctors and consultants are financial, but that's nothing specific to Pakistan or to St. Elizabeth. The other areas confronting us in the areas uh, in management arise from government legislation and dealing with government bodies. The government of Pakistan has introduced e excellent legislation about um, healthcare, but the enforcement is loaded against the private and charitable sector since the government bodies themselves cannot comply with the legislation. 
um, our strategy, and I think this is the important way that we've been able to um, project positivity into the society, has been to anticipate government legislation by putting into practice obvious health regulations relating to infection control, incinerator for medical waste. St. Elizabeth is the only hospital in Hyderabad that has a incinerator system to dispose of medical waste, including, um, that includes uh, all of the government hospitals, which don't have that provision in spite of the legislation. We pay attention to, to the CSSD issues, to pharmaceuticals and environmental issues. So in this regard, we've been well ahead of government hospitals and other private healthcare centers and hospitals. And this has created a positive, upbeat working relationship with government bodies. So we're not in a situation of being down at the bottom, where uh, we, even though we're a small hospital on a minimum budget, we're a, a key player. Uh, as of January 2020, St. Elizabeth has adopted policy and procedures for the protection of minors and vulnerable adults with a trained child protection officer. And so by becoming compliant in this regard with the external standards of the Australian government's uh, charities and not-for-profit commission, St. Elizabeth has anticipated forthcoming Pakistan legislation on this matter. And this is the, uh, the point that we always seek to do to anticipate rather to be in a situation of being forced into conformity. St. Elizabeth's annual reporting emphasizes collaboration with the federal and provincial governments in assisting Pakistan achieve the United Nations 2030 Sustainable Development Goals uh, relating to healthcare. So we seem to be good partners with the government and this has obvious positive implications for how the hospital is perceived by the government. A critical issue that we have to deal with is external corruption. How to ensure the smooth running of the healthcare service of the hospital, while at the same time maintaining Catholic moral standards and compliance with external standards of donor countries relating to graft and corruption. The third and final area that I'd like to look at concerning uh, issues impinging on management of this Catholic health healthcare service is fundraising and use of donor funds. Uh, the key management issues at St. Elizabeth regarding finance have and still revolve around staff competency in administration, in finance, and the professional and the attitudinal requirements for effective church management. Um, honestly, competent personnel have not been immediately available. So St. Elizabeth itself has had to invest a lot of funding and man hours and time in staff development. There isn't any point in saying, as we've agreed here, that no one's able to do it if we don't enable people to become able. So that's our policy. And examples of implementation of this are that St. Elizabeth is an affiliated member of the semi-government Pakistan Institute of Management in Karachi and consistently sends staff for short and extended courses in management. Uh, St. Elizabeth is financially supporting and assisting uh, two key staff members uh, to do their MBA in management. Uh, key management employees were active participants in seminars in church management held on a national basis in October 2018 and 2019. And the hospital administrator will be attending next month the two weeks of intensive church management at um, um, the Pontifical University of Sapporokore. Uh, and we're happy to say that he's just today received his visa to attend that. Um, obviously, there's hiccups and problems which have emerged along our way in our journey towards uh, trying to establish a competent and capable um, systems of administration and management. But this has been part of the process of growing into competence. 
Uh, we have a high level of financial and narrative reporting to donors. And this has been the key to us maintaining a reasonable stream of donations, each in the range of about 25,000 to 35,000 US dollars. Uh, we have found a strategy of proposing easily identifiable and immediately achievable projects with early and clear completion dates as being the most attractive to donor bodies who have responded well to us. And in conclusion, I want to say that side by side and together with faith and competency, uh, I believe that a positive, proactive attitude, the attitude is essential to making sure that management issues in our mission of Catholic healthcare can be and are creatively responded to and effectively handled. Thank you, there we are. So uh, we saw similar challenges between in these uh, two presentations, uh, skill shortage or uh, staff short shortage, uh, co external corruptions and, uh, and the challenges in the regulatory system. So now we move on to another uh, continent. And uh, so we give the floor to Felice Barella, president of the board of uh, University Hospital uh, Campus Biomedico in Rome. And uh, so let's see what are the challenges here. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto. Fortunately, English is not my first language. So <laughs> I will do my best. Uh, yes. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that after having heard the beautiful work performed by our friends from India and from Pakistan, I think that the work that we have here in Europe is much more easier uh, but we have to share some some problems especially financial problems uh, I think also that the, the, the work they make in, in India in Pakistan uh, is very important also in by a, a social point of view because I think that um, health is a value in itself, but also is a, a driver for growth. So um, a healthy population, only a healthy population can achieve its full potential and also its social and economic potential. Keeping people healthy and active for longer has a positive impact on productivity and competitiveness. Uh, health is important to achieve inclusive growth. So the work they made in these countries is crucial, I think. Well, I, I currently uh, am the chairman of the Campus Biomedico uh, University, Rome, uh, different context. Um, my university uh, was founded in 1993, young, very young, um, and is uh, both a university and a hospital, not, not a, only a hospital, but Primarily a, a, a university, university with a school of medicine and also engineering and other, other, other faculties. Um, about um, wellness, uh, well being, uh, and also environment that focuses on, on, on uh, health. Certainly. So the hospital is the main part of, of the 
לא אשתי. research units and two PhD programs and 24 postgraduate schools. Uh, after the, the degree, medical surgery, uh, the students have to uh, make the, a postgraduate school. And we have 24 of them, uh, surgery, medicine, uh, plastic surgery, oncology and so on. Unfortunately, we don't have the, uh, the unit of uh, mother and child. And this is according to the situation of, of Italy and of Europe, where uh, there are <laughs> few, uh, few births uh, and, and many elderly people. Uh, in a few years, uh, in Italy, one third of the population will be over 65. So um, the epidemiology is uh, especially about elderly people or over uh, 65, more or less. Mm. Well, I would like to, to show you some photos, uh, some images of our university. This is the main entrance of the hospital. Uh, the laboratory, uh, this is microbiology and laboratory. And this is the uh, United uh, Intensive Care Units. Um, as you see, uh, we, have, um, we try to um, give an image that is not uh, to uh, uh, the image of classical hospital, that's something uh, more familiar. More similar to a mall, it's a mall, yeah. <laughs> yes. This is radiotherapy. Radiotherapy. Um, for oncology, especially for oncology. Uh, this is a cat lab, they call it. This, uh, they perform uh, PTCA and um, interventional radiology. This is an operating theater. Oh, this is the, the university, the, the, the students spend their time, <laughs> uh, uh, the library. Uh, oh, other things. No. So much. Now, uh, we are. Uh, in the uh, Italian healthcare system that um, provides healthcare for everybody. It's a universal system. Uh, here you see the expenditure uh, on the GDP. This is very different from <laughs> the yeah. from India or, or Pakistan. I don't remember. India. Uh, there they spend. Um, 4.65 it seems to me. Uh, Italy is not too, too much, they spend not too much, about 7% um, public. Now 6.5 seems to me. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And the, the, the dark part is private. Yeah. The, uh, is private. So more uh, public and less private. The private is 2.5. So, as you see, the United States spend a lot, <laughs> uh, more than 14% in public. 
is amazing because the results are not so good. Um, the results, our results in Europe and also in Italy are better if you um, see the hope of life in Italy, hope of life is 80 for men and 84 for women. And in the United States, it's between the women less. So, anyway, <laughs> anyway, it is a, 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 a lot of money. Eh? 7% uh, is about uh, 115 billion or less. But in Italy, uh, everybody uh, has the right to uh, go to the hospital to get uh, medications and so on. Um, well, the, the, the challenges, the, the financial challenges are about uh, how to provide quality, quality care in a context of limited resources and increasing costs. Uh, the costs are increasing because the, the population is uh, el elderly every day more and medication and technology are always more expensive. So it's very important uh, what they call the, the, the management. <laughs> the manager must uh, look for uh, efficiency. Um, uh, every euro or dollar spent, uh, you must ask for uh, it, how it is cost efficient because um, sources are limited. Um, other um, specific challenge uh, is the training of sanitary operators, of doctors, uh, uh, nurses, and technicians, and so on. So uh, this is the reason why we uh, have a, a university um, side by side with the, the hospital because um, it is a, a, a teaching hospital, a hospital where uh, many students um, learn to be a physician or a nurse. Uh, uh, so therapy um, so the problem also they had in, in, in Pakistan a uh, way to solve this problem is uh, to, to have a school um, um, something for, for training for education. I think it's not it's not good only to solve the problem uh, with people from abroad. It's not good to uh, give education. Well, um, another thing that I would like to say is that um, it is a problem, um, <clears throat> an economic problem. <laughs> uh, generally, people think about uh, <coughs> operational <coughs> expenditure, um, the, no, capital expenditure, capital expenditure. Uh, you think that you need a, a machine, uh, the uh, uh, MNF, MNR, 
um, and it costs one million of euros. But there are other problems. The maintenance of the, the machine, generally maintenance is about 10% per year. So if you buy <laughs> something, you must know that every year you must spend 10% uh, to, to maintain it. Um, um, and and if you, uh, when you make a plan, you must think about uh, operational expenditure that are more than than uh, than capital expenditure. Mm. Uh, especially, at least in Europe uh, and in Italy, um, um, human resources are the, the, pre, the, the first uh, voice of <laughs> about 50% of the, the budget is uh, um, in charge. Uh, healthcare is, is expensive. It's very expensive because uh, uh, need many, many people. Uh, in Europe, in Italy, in my experience, for every bed you need three persons. Physician uh, and, and, and nurses and also uh, white collars. <laughs> So, but it is very, very, very important for, for, for the Christianity, for church, is a, a, a great tradition that was begun uh, from the very beginning in, uh, uh, in the fourth century, uh, the way rules about about uh, about hospitals uh, hospital, the, the word hospital um, in the beginning uh, had a meaning a different meaning uh, hospitalis domus hospitalis uh, uh, a house where people poor uh, uh, or pilgrims or, or sick people uh, could live, but there were no no cures, <laughs> no medicine. Uh, only in, in the last century uh, had made uh, important progress. So um, the tradition is, is very very rich. In the sixteenth century. Uh, especially uh, San Juan de Dio, uh, San Juan de Dios, uh, the founder of Father Benito Delli, uh, uh, gave uh, a, 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 a group of them to the, the hospital. And in the, in the, in the following centuries, uh, it has gone on. Uh, <laughs> it, will, it will be uh, anywhere or something um, that can continue. But I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, so I see that uh, uh, the director of the program of church management joined us. Uh, if you want to uh, make a question, a comment, or whatever, if you want to come here, Don Martin Schlag. Well, thank you so much uh, for joining us in this uh, webinar, uh, especially those who uh, have joined us from India and Pakistan. And uh, I have one question for Father McCulloch. Um, you mentioned external corruption as a problem. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can. Yes. 
you, you mentioned external corruption as a problem, um, but hospitals you tend to have to struggle with internal corruption as well. Um, for instance, nepotism or you know bad hiring uh, um, kind of procedures or theft of medicine. And um, I've also noticed that um, sometimes uh, people who live in cultures with endemic corruption tend to feel uh, powerless and uh, as victims of a system. Uh, how do you, uh, is there any attempt to struggle against the, the culture of corruption? That's my question. Yes, thanks, Martin. Actually, um, one of the, I believe, success stories that we've had here at St. Elizabeth's in the last two years with, um, with this new cadre of um, lay administration and lay management, um, competent, trained, motivated, and I would definitely say um, committed to um, a Catholic faith and Catholic principles, um, not just in name, but in reality, the graves, a great success that they had was uncovering a deep stream of internal corruption uh, within the hospital itself. Um, well concealed, well hidden, um, but it was seriously affecting the uh, financial viability uh, of the hospital and its operations. Fortunately, uh, from a distance as a donor representative, uh, and visiting the country twice a year on other matters as well as the hospital, I was able to keep a firm control over the uh, arrival, use, and um, of donor funding. So that wasn't impinged upon. But what was seriously um, uh, subject to this stream of internal corruption was the locally uh, generated income. Um, pilfering hasn't been an issue for us. Um, probably a major issue that has had to be, uh, be resolved was um, a, a lack of commitment shown by quite a number of employees um, simply through absenteeism. And I think absenteeism is an issue or late arrival, whatever it might be, is a major issue that we have to face in appropriating the resources, the limited resources that we have to achieving uh, effective um, health care. That itself also has been um, uh, effectively addressed. Um, I, I believe that what it is, it's been the combination of Catholic lay professionals, committed Catholic lay professionals who are competent and growing into competency and know that their uh, technical skills, professional skills will be supported. This has been our way of overcoming uh, well, first of all, unearthing and then overcoming uh, the streams of internal corruption which we have um, unearthed, which have been unearthed at the hospital. Thank you very much. And uh, congratulations to what all of you are achieving. I give back to Robert. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Monsignor uh, Schlag. And uh, so uh, I, I also have a question, uh, if uh, you don't mind. So my question is uh, um, both to uh, Father 
Abraham and Father McCulloch. So um, I see that in other countries, in India and in Pakistan, the public expenditures for healthcare is uh, very low in, in comparison to Europe. So, uh, and uh, the, the Catholic uh, identity of uh, the hospitals there uh, impose uh, to give care also to the marginalized population. So those without any means for living and for uh, paying the healthcare, uh, their care, uh, uh, their care uh, uh, service. So uh, my question is, so you, how do you balance your Catholic identity with your uh, balance sheets? So uh, do you rely uh, mostly on donors for, for this or what, what is the, the, the solution? In, and uh, what the Catholic Association uh, does for, uh, for helping its, uh, its members in, on, this, on, this, uh, on this case? Thank you. Thanks, Roberto. Firstly, I'd like to say, Roberto, that unfortunately, as I mentioned, we don't have uh, a Pakistan Catholic Health um, Association, unlike India. And Father Abraham, I am so jealous of you people in India. But <laughs> um, uh, we, realistically, there's probably eight Catholic hospitals in Pakistan, and I had hoped that we could um, collaborate on a some level, unfortunately, there's zero collaboration. Um, in response to the uh, needs of people utterly without uh, health care and without the means to pay for health care, uh, we set up, as I said, this mobile medical outreach program, which caters to 50,000 people, really, really poorly deprived, marginalized people in um, the rural areas out from, uh, out from Hyderabad. Um, this is totally funded by uh, a corporate donor in Australia. We managed to do it on an annual budget of 120,000 Australian dollars, which is round about, let's say, 100,000 US dollars. Um, top quality medicine is provided to patients with a team of three doctors, nurses, vehicles going out to them. Um, and serious cases are always referred back and uh, treated free of charge in the hospital. I think, Father uh, Abraham and myself, we know that we can stretch uh, donor money to really um, uh, make it work. $100,000 in a European or Australian or a United States context might seem uh, a minimal amount of money, but for us, it's a huge uh, amount that we can do a lot with. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Roberto, for that question. See, uh, in India, uh, what we do uh, is um, we focus more on primary health care and uh, community health. Uh, rather than tertiary care. So uh, we, if you look at our uh, institutions, 80% of them are uh, small health centers uh, doing primary uh, health care. And uh, there's a lot of uh, health promotion, disease prevention activities happening in the network. So that's the way uh, we help people to you know, uh, reduce the cost of uh, expenses. When it comes to secondary care and tertiary care, uh, to some extent, we use a principle called cross-subsidization. So we take money from the uh, rich people and then we subsidize for the poor. So a lot of money is being, uh, uh, a lot of charity is being done uh, through this principle. Uh, unlike commercial uh, establishments, most of our infrastructure were built uh, through donations. So we don't have bank loans or we don't have much liabilities. Uh, so that also helps to keep the healthcare uh, cost uh, lesser. And in addition to that, there's a lot of volunteerism. Um, uh, Father Robert might have uh, uh, noticed the fact that we have a lot of uh, nuns 
uh, working in in healthcare uh, who do not take a salary they take only a, a kind of an honorary uh, so we uh, cost our cost of healthcare is much less compared to uh, commercial entities overall but we also use the principle of cross subsidization uh, we also depend on donations uh, there are people who uh, help especially when it comes to areas like uh, uh, primary care community health uh, disability care those areas where we will uh, and care for people at the margin so these are some of the ways we uh, we keep the principle of uh, helping people who are you know at the margins and who are poor Okay, thank you. Uh, is there any questions, uh, even uh, from the people on online? Uh, if you have any questions, uh, now it's the time. And uh, in the meanwhile, you you think about it. Uh, I ask another question, maybe. And uh, so uh, you said uh, you uh, that uh, um, there is a. Um, a shortage of vocations also in uh, in India and uh, probably also in Pakistan you don't have uh, so many uh, Catholic physicians and nurses to rely upon so uh, you are uh, forced like in Italy as well uh, to rely upon uh, uh, non-Christian personnel or uh, uh, in Italy non practicing Catholic so uh, is there a, a problem for your Catholic identity in uh, in the hospitals, or uh, how do you um, how to respond to this challenge as an association and as a hospital? So first, uh, Father Matthew, uh, this time. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> um, well. Um... Uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, majority of our staff uh, is from the non-Catholic background. Uh, we there are common values uh, which these non-Catholics also believe in, like uh, uh, values of social justice. So those principles are all, you know, uh, those uh, especially the the social principles of the church is very much uh, appreciated and respected by even the other uh, people of the other faiths and you know, uh, those who work with us. But when it comes to certain uh, core Catholic values of uh, uh, family planning or you know, those kind of things, uh, most of these uh, people of the other faiths, uh, uh, I think Muslims understand that, but uh, Hindus or other, because in our country it is mostly Hindus, they really don't understand those values. Uh, but they respect our uh, faith, our, our uh, value system. So even though they don't understand, you know, uh, we uh, we keep those principles in our hospitals. But there are also uh, situations where sisters go through a lot of pressure uh, from uh, patients, especially patients who are non-Catholics, uh, who uh, who are not from the Catholic, who don't believe in the Catholic principles. Uh, for example, when it comes to a situation where uh, uh, a patient uh, or a, a woman is having a, a fourth cesarean or a fifth cesarean and uh, the uterus is you know, uh, not very strong, uh, there's a pressure to do uh, a tubectomy because of you know, uh, health reasons. So uh, uh, when it comes to those kind of situations, sisters go through a lot of dilemma. But then we also, we have to take it case by case, uh, taking into consideration the moral theology principles. So uh, other, otherwise, overall, uh, we have no problem in retaining our Catholic uh, identity. We do retain that. Yes. Okay. Father Robert? <clears throat> yes, the, the situation that we have in Pakistan is that there were actually very few religious congregations that um, uh, commit any of their personnel to health care. Um, I think this goes back to 1973 when the government nationalized all Catholic schools. They've since been returned. 
but at that time there was a loss of nerve in uh, the Catholic Church in Pakistan and I think the feeling was, I wasn't there in the country at that time, arrived just five years later, that as the schools have gone, so the hospitals will go, so there wasn't an investment in the hospital, personnel were withdrawn, and we actually were faced with the collapse of really, for the 1970s, an outstanding system or network of Catholic hospitals. Since then, um, very few religious uh, congregations of women or men have committed uh, personnel to health care. For that reason, the Catholic health situation that we have in Pakistan, St. Elizabeth, is lay focused, lay ministered, lay uh, managed, and the lay people do it extremely well. Um, on the issue of um, maintaining our Catholic identity. Um, to tell you the truth, uh, given all of the popular talk about um, the anti-Christian uh, or anti-Catholic feeling that's supposed to be in Pakistan because it's a Muslim country, and I should say supposed to be here, um, I'm continually surprised actually that Muslim doctors, Hindu doctors, wish to come to our hospital as consultants, as RMOs. Um, the three hospital doctors that we have, one is Hindu, two are Hindu and uh, one is Muslim, um, who participate extraordinarily well in the um, how should I say, the, the mission and thrust and direction of St. Elizabeth as a Catholic healthcare um, organization. Uh, we do insist in the contract, as I mentioned, that the doctors uh, undertake to maintain the uh, ethical standards of the hospital as a Catholic hospital. Um, and in my understanding that I get from the Director of Clinical Services, who's a, a practicing Christian, a woman, um, but she's the Director of Clinical Services, she says that she is satisfied that um, moral principles of the hospital as a Catholic institution are being maintained. Um, it does present the, the, the the other side of what Pakistan really is, that there's more going on here uh, in the level of um, harmonious interfaith relations in the environment of healthcare than people will allow uh, as the normal reality of what Pakistan is supposed to be. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions, any final questions? Uh, from the internet I see Pauline has raised a hand. Pauline, are you there? Mm, no? Okay, so I think we can uh, stop here. And uh, I thank you all for being with us. I, I think it was a very interesting conversation, discussion about the challenges of a health care. So you are warned. On, uh, what to expect you if you want to join the, this sector uh, as a priest or as a lay leader of a Catholic institution like this. Thank you, uh, dear speakers, for your time. I know that there it's uh, almost midnight, I think. And uh, yeah, really, thank you very much. And, uh, and God bless you for all your efforts and work uh, in the church. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh,
C. Uh, okay. uh, Father McCallo, are you still there? So yes, I am. So now it's a, a question arrived now from the internet. Um, uh, some uh, Pauline uh, Amogu uh, asked, uh, what is the relation of the hospitals in India and Pakistan to traditional practitioners? What do you think? How can we respond? I suppose, can you hear me? Is that, can you hear? Just a moment. Can you hear me? I hear you, I hear you, yes. Okay, fine. Look, um, in Pakistan, what we have is not so much uh, traditional medicine as I think uh, would be experienced in Africa, but it's what's called the Unani system of medicine. Uh, Unani comes from the, the word Yunan, which is Greek. And this is the uh, form of medicine that was um, presumed to have been brought across by the Macedonians with Gregory, uh, with uh, Alexander the Great and others after that and has spread through our Pakistan. It's based upon base, uh, mainly uh, herbal medicine and um, um, forms of massage. It's um, actually what I see, it's sort of, uh, it's, it's homeopathic medicine rather than traditional medicine. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this last question. And thank you, Pauline. I hope uh, you you heard the, the answer. Okay, yes, she heard. Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Good night.